Hi everyone, I'm Andrew. Um, I'm here um, to talk about modeling fare evasion on the Transantiago bus network. So I'm doing research at the Universidad de Chile uh, in the Department of Industrial Engineering. Um, and I guess, let's see how this works. Oops. I don't know what I'm pressing right now. Okay. Um, so I guess the presentation outline will be um, talking about the main project that I'm working on, which is looking at modeling fare evasion um, on the bus network. And then on the side, um, we're also looking at like another project that's maybe more on the theoretical side. And then I'll talk a little bit about myself and some of the other things that I'm interested in while in Chile. So um, I guess this project is in the general area of like game theory, algorithmic game theory, my background. Um, during my undergrad and master's uh, was in computer science, so um, this is kind of like the approach that we're looking at um, the following problem. So um, I guess with public transportation, um, one main problem that we often see is fare evasion. Um, as you, I don't know if any of you guys have tried uh, taking the bus here in Santiago. So um, I guess the way the buses are set up is like you're meant to get on at the front door where you tap in, but like the buses might have two or three doors, and if people just walk in the back, um, like you don't have to pay. So I guess as like I guess as customers we probably like don't want to pay because you want to save money for for whatever reason, and we see that there have been like news articles saying that uh, back in like 2018. Uh, Fair evasion reaches um, up to like 28.5%. Um, I would like to note that um, the problem, I guess, like s that we're looking at spans beyond just like modeling. Like, there's also a lot of interesting incentive questions. Um, just on a side note, um, in Santiago, you have like a centralized um, bus operator. It's called Trans Santiago, that um, was formed around like I think 10 or 12 years ago. Um, before um, this, like if you go to Valparaiso or other cities, you have these like micros that go around, and the way you pay for them is like you pay in cash. Um, you get on the bus, and the bus drivers um, are basically paid by um, the amount of uh, people that get on the bus, the amount of fare they collect. So they're operating by very different incentives um, compared to like the model that we have in Santiago now, where you have your bib card, you tap in, and um, drivers are paid basically by an hourly wage. So what you see in Valparaiso is that um, bus drivers are incentivized to drive very fast because they want to pick up as many people as possible. Um, and they're also incentivized to actually collect fares um, to make sure that people pay because that's how they make money. Well, um, with this newer system, I guess you get more standardized wages. Um, but the problem, I guess you also get drivers that drive safer. Um, but the problem is that um, bus drivers are no longer as incentivized to um, like actually collect fare because um, there have been cases in the past, like in New York or other places, where um, drivers have gotten into arguments with like non-paying customers and potentially gotten injured or like beaten up. So um, there's like a different incentive system there. Um, so what we model, or I would like to say that this project has kind of been a continuation of uh, sorry uh, work that has been done, I guess, at the University of Chile, and I'm joining some of the people on this project. And um, uh, actually, I want to go. With, how do I want to? Um, and I guess um, the idea is that we are modeling, um, I guess, this variation problem as like this um, optimization problem, thinking about it maybe from more of the game theory perspective. Um, so I guess the, the idea is that if you think about um, the way we can actually deal with fair evasion, um, the way it works is that you have inspectors that randomly get on buses at certain places, um, certain routes, and I guess just randomly get on. Um, if you're a fair evader, you don't know where this is going to happen. Um, and if you're caught, you pay a fine. It's like a pretty standard policy. Um, so I guess you think about this as like a two-layer optimization problem from the 
from the Theravader side, which we call them the followers, um, the idea is that um, you have a general idea of the probabilities of like which bus lines um, have fare inspectors on them. So if you want to get from like a certain origin to a certain destination, um, you would optimize your route to minimize costs, which is a function of, um, I guess, time, a function of um, like uh, the probability of you getting caught, and a function of like how much you'd actually have to pay if you were to buy a ticket. Um, and given that, um, like, given that the fare evaders have a certain way of going through the graph, um, the inspectors or the government will then uh, try to place fare um, fair inspectors along like certain bus routes to try to maximize like the amount of people um, getting caught to maximize their profit, and they're all operating groups and pressing the wrong button. Um, and um, I guess the idea is like you can kind of model this as like um, a linear program. I don't really want to go too much into the mathematical <laughs> details there, um, but. Um, so I guess the idea is that, well, if you can model essentially where um, these evaders will go, we have uh, data, I guess, sorry, shown on the previous slide of like certain regions that have more um, evasion than other regions, which like in a way actually correlates to um, socioeconomic status of the certain regions uh, in Santiago. Um, you can kind of like um, try to model like um, where people will uh, go, like, I guess, um, in the path. Um, so one thing that I guess I'm looking in in this project um, is something called, I guess, like, um, we're looking at basically origin destination pairs of um, fare evaders, like where they will go in the path, and given the data that we know of where people actually pay go, we're trying to basically model um, where the fare evaders go. Um, so one way to do this is we basically use this model called the gravity model, um, which is basically um, the idea that like if you know, um, if you have like an underlying matrix of um, the people who pay fare, of where they travel from certain origins to certain destinations, um, the assumption that we make is that um, fare evaders are essentially more inclined to evade on shorter paths than longer paths, um, and the intuition of this is, well, um, like, if you go on a longer path, you, if you have a longer journey, then you're probably more likely to get caught, so you might just pay for a ticket yourself. Um, so the idea is, like, well, we can try to model, um, we can try to model, uh, given the data of uh, the people who pay fare, of where the people who don't pay go, and if we can come up with like this model properly, um, we can work with like the Transantiago agency um, to essentially tell them where to place their um, fare inspectors along um, certain bus routes to try to like optimize for um, essentially where um, you can maximize your profit or like, try to minimize fare evasion. Okay, so um, so that's kind of like a project that I've been joining, um, and another project that we're trying to start, I guess, as I uh, go along with the Fulbright uh, program is something more theoretical in nature, which is um, investigating properties of price and anarchy in network congestion games, which I will try to go more in depth. In. So um, I guess just to start off with, are you guys familiar with like? The general idea of game theory. Um, mm -hmm. So it's basically um, this idea that um, if you set up a game where you have like different agents um, that are incentivized by like uh, certain rewards, um, in some cases like um, you might end up with like an equilibrium um, that the players um, will basically stick to certain strategies that they don't want to change, that no one wants to change, but is not the socially optimal solution. So a classic example is the prisoner's dilemma in that um, like, um, 
you know that, I guess, if there's two prisoners and your choice is to either, like, uh, cooperate with the police or not cooperate, then, um, like, what ends up happening is that both prisoners will, um, they will not cooperate and they will basically get lower reward um, than if they both cooperated because um, the idea is like if you confess um, and the other person, uh, sorry, if you work with the government and the other person doesn't, then you'll get more jail time. Um, while like if both of you like confess um, and work with the government, you'll both get, um, I guess, less jail time, but because um, like an individual, it's more optimal for you from your own perspective to basically um, optimize for your own solution, then you'll end up with this um, equilibrium that is actually not socially optimal. I hope this is making sense. Um, okay. Um, so another model that we look at um, is this thing called a network congestion game. Um, so on a super high level, um, I guess the one takeaway I want from this is the idea that um, if you think about like transportation networks and stuff, like intuitively, if you build more roads, if you build more connections, it should um, increase traffic flow, right? Um, but this is not always the case. Um, there are certain cases where if you actually add more roads, it'll decrease the overall flow. Um, and I'll try to convince you of that real quickly. Um, so the model that we use is something called a network congestion game. The idea is that um, you think about a graph, um, and people are trying to go from like a source uh, to a destination. And the cost of using a certain edge is basically the amount of flow that goes through the edge. Uh, multiplied by like a certain cost function. Um, so in here, if you assume that there's like two players, um, the optimal solution, uh, which is also an equilibrium in this graph, is to have like uh, each person like um, use like half flow on the top and the bottom, which gives you a overall cost of um, three halves because it's one half times one plus one half times one half. Uh, which would give you like three over four, and then you have two of those. Um, but if you introduce this edge of zero cost here, um, what ends up happening is that um, the equilibrium solution is for both parties to each route like half flow along this path here, um, which gives an overall cost of two. Um, because um, if if you see that there's like overall um, like unit flow going on this path, um, and you're thinking about deviating, like if you if you choose to go along this path, if you have like 0 0.01 units of flow, and you choose to go on this path while everyone else goes on that path, you're going to incur more cost going here than if you went there. So then, like by introducing this edge here. Um, instead of having this socially optimal solution in here, you end up with like an equilibrium solution, which is even worse. So um, I'm happy to talk about like anything transportation related afterwards, but um, what we define, um, which is called the price of anarchy, is basically um, the bound between um, the socially optimal solution and your worst case um, equilibrium solution which for here is uh, 2 divided by 3 over 2, which is 4 thirds. Um, and so some of the research that I'll be doing is like involving network congestion games. Well, we can um, consider different models, whether you allow like multiple players to start at different uh, sources and destinations, um, whether they can actually like split their flow or not, um, and things that um, I'm still trying to figure out. But, uh, I hope this wasn't too tech or boring, but I think it's a really cool concept. Um, it applies in like real life when you think about highways and how um, a lot of times we're trying to drive selfishly, but that's not actually what's best for society overall. Um, and I'm working with uh, Professor Jose Correa at the Department of Industrial Engineering at the University of Chile, so I'm in Santiago. 
um, and just some other things about me. Um, I don't actually know if this is outreach. This is more just like things I like to do. So I like cycling um, and um, also enjoy photography. Um, so if there's any like interest in collaboration on that end, I would also love to work with you guys or help out in any sense. And um, yeah, excited for the months to come. scientist what draws my attention to this project and it might just be a methodological epistemological division is uh -huh. there there the fair evader the follower himself herself is not really problematized right not really he or she doesn't have a subjectivity in this study right they are just a function in in the equation and so I'm wondering if the broader project it seems like there are a bunch of people that have been working on this study for a long time if you're also doing mixed methods and doing things like qualitative interviews, mm -hmm. participant observation, and adding flesh to the bone, which, which a model can, you know, a model can give you a bone, mm -hmm. but the sort of ground truthing or you know, the the benefits of qualitative research, where you can really get down to the nitty gritty and sort of say like, why aren't you paying your fare? Is it an issue of lack of resources? Is it an issue that this is how you express your anarchism against the state, against an institution mm -hmm. that doesn't? Mm -hmm. um, that you don't believe in, or that you know you are silently sort of every day protesting. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm curious. I just think like a qualitative piece here would be super interesting um, too. Yeah, that that is like a really good point, and um, I guess something that I've been talking a little a bit with my collaborators on, just like looking at how you can incorporate like information beyond just a mathematical model. Um, I guess we've looked at like from maybe more of a data perspective, we try to model like. Um, socioeconomic status compared mm -hmm. to, um, I guess, location of uh, fear evasion to give us better information. And uh, I think in terms of like some of the qualitative stuff that we've looked at is just like, you can actually look at correlation between the number of doors on a bus to fear evasion. In other words, the more doors you have, the more fear evasion. And I think when it comes to like talking to individuals, that's probably something that we also want to look into. <coughs> So sort of similar in drawing on like my background, which is not very related, but it's cool to think about intersections. So when you want to change behavior, you identify like the function of the behavior, which is like sort of what you're saying, right? But then also you reinforce the behavior that you want to see more than like punish the behavior that you don't want to see, right? So mm -hmm. I'm thinking about like, um, yeah, like just out of curiosity, like any discussion of like rather than like how can we better catch and penalize the fair evaders, is there any discussion of like how can we like reward the like good citizens that get on at the front of the bus mm -hmm. in a culture of like anarchy or whatever <laughs> the function is? Any like discussions or or your just thoughts on like that? Um, I think that is definitely a very good point. Um, I guess I can't say I know too much about like public policy when it comes to like uh, fair evasion. I know there has been like ties of saying like um, that they're saying if you don't pay your uh, fine for um, fair evasion, that this should be tied to like this should be considered like a criminal activity. So it's kind of like going in the opposite direction of enforcing. Um, the payment. I think when it comes to looking at rewarding citizens, um, um, one one way to deal with this problem maybe is just to like uh, make public transit like subsidized, more subsidized, or free for everyone. Um, but that's I guess not too much that explored. But it's something you get to think about. Yeah. Which, Oh, that's good. You go ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> I've been, I just had a conversation on the bus ride on the way to Santiago yesterday about uh -huh. the extreme hike of prices in transportation in, in Santiago. And like specifically, mm -hmm. they talked about how it doesn't matter where you go in the city, that yeah. you have to pay 800 pesos depending. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you can go all the way across town or you can go to one block away. Yeah. And we talked 
it's like crazy that you're that you're doing this project and that I had this discussion about a, like a, a uh -huh. person that does this. He said like I jump on because I don't have eight hundred thousand. I don't. I don't have eight hundred pesos to yeah. pay. And so I wonder if like if you could look at the the price uh, hike. Uh -huh. Because of like Trans Santiago and, and see if there's a correlation between the hike in prices and the lack of like distinguishing in prices of where you're going to go in the distance versus mm -hmm. fare region. Uh -huh. And see, I, I, I bet it might have a correlation. Uh -huh. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah. Point. Uh, I think, I guess, I, I don't know too much, I've just started, but I think there has been like a price hike recently, as you mentioned. And um, I think with that, there has been studies showing that um, the fares have been, or the evasion rate has been going up. Um, to kind of counter your point on having a flat fare, I guess there has been a lot of debate in this area about whether you should have like distance-based fare or flat fares. Um, flat fares also help with like having real estate prices uh, that are far away from the city um, to keep them low because this way you allow like longer commute distances without penalizing um, the costs. So yeah, it's like a very, yeah, it's, it's a difficult a lot of like people are traveling from super far outside the city to be nanas in the really rich neighborhoods, right. and so distance would be a it would be a regressive tax. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thanks. 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 Thanks.